welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, my name is James and welcome to episode one of a brand new podcast created by Madden America. This podcast is part of Madden America's mission to serve as a catalyst for rethinking psychiatric care. We believe that the current drug-based paradigm of care has failed our society, and that scientific research, as well as the lived experience of those who have been diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder, calls for profound change. On the podcast over the coming weeks, we'll have interviews with experts and those with lived experience of the psychiatric system. Thank you for joining us as we discuss the many issues around rethinking psychiatric care across the world. If you'd like to get in touch, you can email us on podcasts at maddenamerica.com. It would be great to hear from you. This week, we interviewed Jim Gottstein, president of the organization Law Project for Psychiatric Rights. Jim grew up in Anchorage, Alaska before attending the University of Oregon and graduating from Harvard Law School in 1978. From 2002 until the end of 2016, Mr. Gottstein devoted the bulk of his time to the Law Project for Psychiatric Rights, whose mission is to mount a strategic litigation campaign against forced psychiatric drugging and electroshock across the United States. Starting in 2004, Jim made addressing the alarming and horrific increase in the psychiatric drugging of children and youth a high priority. Jim has also devoted considerable time trying to make alternatives to psychiatric drugs available in Alaska through Soteria Alaska and Choices Incorporated. I was keen to talk to Jim about his own experiences of the mental health system, his thoughts on the rights of psychiatric patients, and the recent trial between Wendy Dolan and the UK pharmaceutical manufacturer GlaxoSmithKline. Jim, thank you so much for talking with me today. Firstly, for the listeners, could you tell us a little bit about your background and your experiences with the mental health care system? Well, I grew up in Anchorage, Alaska, you know, a pretty privileged uh, background and went to uh, college and law school and did everything. I felt like, you know, that there was nothing that I really couldn't do. Um, and I got in a situation where I didn't get sleep and I uh, got psychotic and jumped out of my dad's uh, second floor window at about two in the morning uh, in June in my underwear. So I, I became psychotic and I knew uh, how to do a parachute landing fall. Uh, so I looked down the window, out the window, and there was um, this little sidewalk down there. And I knew that if I didn't hit that, I would be okay. And I jumped out and did a parachute landing fall. And, but anyway, I was captured and taken to the hospital. This was in 1982 when I was, uh, 29. And, um, when I was in the hospital, basically the message that I got was that I was mentally ill, that, you know, I'd have to take these drugs for the rest of my life and that I'd never practice as a lawyer again. And I was just lucky. I got connected up with a psychiatrist finally after a couple other ones uh, who told me, well, you just didn't get sleep. Anybody who doesn't get sleep will become psychotic. You just have to uh, manage that, and you should be fine. And so I feel like I really escaped being made permanently mentally ill by the mental health system. So that pretty much changed the trajectory of my life. Thank you, Jim. And what was it that led to your work in psychiatric law and patient rights? I worked on this a big lawsuit. It was the biggest lawsuit in Alaska at the time against the state of Alaska, which stole a million acres of land that had been given in trust for the mental health program. But then, and I was on the Alaska Mental Health Board, the the statewide planning board for mental health services in Alaska. And I, I pretty much, you know, kind of knew the story about the drugs, but didn't feel there was anything I could really do about it. Um, and then I read Mad in America in 2002 by uh, Robert Whitaker. And to me, it not only was a, a great book, which it is, but it was a litigation roadmap for how to challenge forced psychiatric drugging through arguing that it's not in people's best interests. I mean, most, you know, in the, in the past, basically people were arguing uh, civil rights, human rights, uh, that kind of thing. But there was this assumption that it was in people's best interests. And Mad in America really showed that it wasn't. So I, I actually connected up with Mr. Whitaker at a NARPA con- conference that 
uh, November, I think, in 2002, NARPA stands for the National Association of Rights Protection and Advocacy, which is a group of NARPA.org, which is a group of uh, psychiatric survivors and lawyers, mental health lawyers. And I also met Lauren Mosier there, who founded, who's the chief of schizophrenia research in the 1970s at the National Institute of Mental Health in the U.S., um, and he was the one who conducted the Soteria House study, and Michael Perlin, who's considered the, the, an icon of mental health disability law. So I had formed, uh, after reading Mad in America, the Law Project for Psychiatric Rights to mount a strategic litigation campaign against forced psychiatric drugging and electroshock. And it, it was basically based on the research in Mad in America, which has been updated. And when I contacted Bob Whitaker, uh, I got him to send me all of the, the research cited in Mad in America. And that's on our website, Scientific Research by Topic section. I guess that's a long-winded answer, but that's basically how it came about. Thank you, Jim. You really are taking on some strong vested interests there in standing up for patient rights and laws around mental health. Certainly in the UK and the USA, the power vested in mental health laws and legislation is enormous. In the UK, it pretty much amounts to legalized discrimination, and that needs challenge, doesn't it? Yes, and it's basically um, all based on fraud. I mean, there's a fraud on, you know, in terms of the drugs, but there's also, in terms of locking people up, in the US, you can only lock someone up if uh, they're a, a danger to themselves or others, and there's no less restrictive alternative. And I, I don't think more than 10% of the people that are locked up for you know being accused of mentally ill and dangerous actually meet that criteria. And for forced drugging, you have to show, there may be some question about this, but not much, I don't think. You have to show that it's in the person's best interest and that there's no less intrusive alternative. And before that, you really have to show that they're not competent to decide to not take the drugs. And all of that essentially fraudulent in, in the cases, um, you know, when people are forced to take these drugs. I mean, I think uh, that was the focus of, you know, psych rights in terms of the Mad in America research to show that it's not in people's best interest. But also, you know, there there are less intrusive alternatives, and that's what Soteria House showed. That's what Open Dialogue is showing in, you know, in Finland. And so it, it's, I don't think that anybody can actually be constitutionally, these are con U.S. constitutional principles, anybody in the U.S. can constitutionally meet those criteria for being drugged against their will. But the big problem is that society believes all this propaganda by the pharmaceutical industry and the psychiatric industry. And so they basically say, well, if this person wasn't crazy, she'd know this was good for her, and therefore... We're not going to let her pesky legal rights get in the way of doing to her what uh, we think is right. And so that's why changing public attitudes is uh, so important and why I, th I think it's so important for you to have this podcast. Thank you, Jim. It's important to me that we get to talk about the parts of the mental health care system that aren't often witnessed. There is a general assumption that mental health care is of great benefit, and that's true for many people. But equally, there are many people that are detained or forcibly drugged, and that can have life-changing consequences. That's really a difficult place to be, isn't it? Yeah, and I don't, I don't have any complaint or criticism of people who decide to take the drugs, that is, adults anyway. I, I think that's their choice. But the idea that you can for the government can force someone to take these drugs that have that are so counterproductive, especially when they're forced, uh, and have such negative impacts on their quality of life, and in fact uh, shorten people's lives to by up to 25 years, is really an outrage to say the least. And Jim, how does it feel to be a person standing up for others who have had their rights taken away from them? Does that keep you awake at night? Well, obviously, I feel uh, very good about it. And unfortunately, my financial situation has deteriorated to the point where I've had to back off of it. And that actually upsets me. But there's another aspect of this, which is these cases come up really fast. 
So one of the things that I've done to deal with my problem with, you know, with, you know, that led to my hospitalization, and I had another one in uh, 1985, is that I basically really try and uh, be on top of my workload. So, for example, for legal briefs, I will tend to file them at least the day before they're due. And so that way I'm not, you know, really worrying about getting them done and, you know, thinking about everything that I have to do. And these cases uh, are just perfect for uh, a perfect setup to get me in trouble because they come up very fast and and I have to do a lot of work and in a very short period of time. But even then I've managed to... Uh, to stay out of trouble doing it. Well, Jim, thank goodness there are people like you who are willing to stand up for others' rights in this. The financials of this are so galling, aren't they? Because no one would disagree that the pharmaceuticals are one of the wealthiest businesses on the planet, and anyone in opposition to the normal paradigm of psychiatric care is often reduced to scratching around for resources. So to challenge that wealth and influence is really difficult, isn't it? Well, it's. I think of it kind of like a, being in a guerrilla war where you have to you know, really be smart about that. Now, the cases that I take where, where the government is trying to force someone to uh, take the drugs or lock them up, um, the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical companies are not involved in those. It's, you know, a single government lawyer. Um, so it's not, you know, that part's not quite so daunting. But the, the deck is really stacked against the patient in so many ways. Um, I mean, they have the psychiatrist or other so-called expert witness who's just right there. They're in Alaska. In a lot of places, they're done right at the hospital. So they don't, you know, it's not even an inconvenience. They come in and they testify for five to 15 minutes. And to try and mount a defense to that is really quite difficult. You have to, it's virtually impossible to win one of these cases without having your own expert witness, at least on the drugging part. Uh, you hear about people winning even uh, without lawyers on the uh, commitment part. But even then, that's very, that's, that's rare. You know, if, if you want to try and arrange for other witnesses, now, when I take these cases or took these cases, I would tell pe- people, look, at I have to, you have to uh, agree to at least a, Lisa, a day or two extension while I try and put something together. And if you you can do that and have a chance of winning, or you can take your public defender uh, and almost certainly lose. And it's quite typical for, in Alaska anyway, and I don't think that's unusual, for the petition to commit someone and force drug them be filed in, in the morning and have a hearing that afternoon on it. And the lawyers, you know, may, you know, meet the client and talk to them for a few minutes before the hearing, which is a trial, basically. And it's just a farce in terms of a legal proceeding. That must be very difficult for you to respond to, because building a case in response takes time, doesn't it? Right. And you need and it's really good to have other witnesses. I mean, because a person comes in with their credibility just totally challenged right from the beginning. I mean, they're being accused of being crazy. Um, So anything they say is, you know, really um, looked at uh, scance. And then if, you know, one of the really key things is to have a less restrictive alternative and to try and put that together, uh, take you know, takes, you know, a little bit of work to say the least. Thank you, Jim. I'd like to move on now to talk about the recent trial between the UK pharmaceutical manufacturer GlaxoSmithKline and the widow of Stuart Dolan. You covered the trial and the outcome in an article on Madden America recently, and I wondered if you could briefly summarize the trial for those who may not be aware of the events and the outcome. You bet. And actually, um, Bob Fitterman from uh, the UK covered the trial, and I picked it up from there, and he did a really good and pretty comprehensive blog on a kind of a day-by-day, blow-by-blow account of the trial. But in summary, um, Stuart Dolan was uh, a lawyer at a very big uh, law firm in Chicago, and he, you know, he was under some stress, and and his doctor prescribed uh, the generic version of uh, Paxil. And um, he immediately started 
you know, acting differently and being really agitated and, and stuff. And a few days later, he, he jumped in front of a train and got killed. So his widow, Wendy, sued uh, GlaxoSmithKline. So he was prescribed the generic version of Paxil, which was manufactured by a company named Mylan. And uh, Wendy sued Mylan and uh, GlaxoSmithKline, GSK. And the problem was it was almost a catch-22 because Mylan, and and the argument was that uh, Stewart's doctor was not informed about the propensity of Paxil to cause people to commit suicide. And so that was that was the grounds for suing uh, the manufacturer and you know, GSK and Mylan. Well, the catch-22 was that Mylan was pre- prohibited from providing any information that wasn't approved by the FDA. In other words, that was on what's called the label. And GSK didn't make the the pill, you know, the drug that uh, Stewart took. And so Mylan got dismissed from the case um, on that grounds because they they couldn't be required to uh, provide information which they were prohibited to provide. In other words, they weren't negligent for doing that. And GSK argued, well, we can't be sued because we didn't manufacture the pill that he took. But Wendy's lawyers were really brilliant, uh, and and they came up with this um, just common law negligence claim against GSK, which was you have the GSK had the duty to everybody to provide accurate information about the drug, and they breached that duty. They violated that duty by not informing the doctor, and therefore they should be liable for that caused the death, and that and therefore they should be liable. And they won on that. Okay, so that was the legal part of it, which that's the trial court decision, and it's fairly likely that GSK will appeal that. And but one of the I think so that's the legal stuff, uh, except for I think that in the end it might not really be that bad for the manufacturers because it gives them even more incentive to badmouth their drugs once they come off patent. Uh, the trial itself in the uh, Bob Fitterman's blog has, uh, uh, like I said, a day-by-day account of it. And it, and it was very, I think, riveting. And he goes into basically how despicable um, GSK was and not informing people and their expert witnesses who, who basically you know, got up and lied. And, and they really showed very clearly that GSK knew very early on that it caused suicide. They um, basically fraudulently modified the accounts of what was going on in the trials. So they would do things like change uh, suicidal behavior to, instead of saying suicidal ideation, they would say uh, agitation and those kind of things. They hid actual completed suicides and those sorts of things. And Dr. David Healy was really key in that. And uh, I think uh, Joseph Glenmull and uh, another psychiatrist who's very familiar with the research and been an expert in a number of cases uh, also testified. It's a really important case. I mean, I'm trying to think they didn't get that much money. It was $3 million, wasn't it? But to lose your husband and the impact on the family is incalculable. And Jim, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that point about Stuart Dolan taking a generic version of a brand name drug, but Wendy Dolan being able to sue the brand name manufacturer GSK, I think I'm right in saying that's a legal first, isn't it? Yes, I think it is. And that's why I said that her lawyers were brilliant in coming up with, uh, with that approach. Thank you, Jim. And I also wanted to ask what happens next, because I know there's been talk of an appeal. Where are we in that process? On May 25th, uh, GSK moved for a new trial uh, on various grounds uh, that the jury wasn't given proper instructions. Court made improper 
uh, exclusions of evidence, admission and exclusion of evidence. So I've looked at that. So it seems moderately unlikely that the judge will grant that motion, but it's, uh, I think, setting up the uh, appeal. They want to get all their arguments in the record for the appeal to say that the court made all these mistakes that uh, should require a new new trial. And Jim, I wondered, is an appeal conducted the same way as a full trial? For example, will a jury be present or is it a different approach entirely? Oh, I'm really glad you asked that question. It's a good question. No, an appeal is just on the record, on the trial record. So you have all the motions and exhibits that were filed before the trial and then you have the transcript of the trial. And then the appeal is about whether or not there were any errors in law that the judge made. It's extremely rare for a court to overrule a jury on the factual decisions. The jury gets to decide the facts, but the judge decides the law and how the law applies to the facts. And so the appeal is usually strictly over whether or not the judge made errors of law. And it's based uh, solely on the, the lower court record. Mm-hmm. So uh, I see this motion for a new trial as GSK wanting to make sure that it has all its arguments in the record when it goes up to appeal. You know, it's possible that the trial court will grant a new trial, mm-hmm. but that seems pretty unlikely. And Jim, what's the precedent for appeals like this? I'm aware that there have been several trials involving pharmaceuticals. This one is different for reasons that we've previously discussed, but where verdicts have gone against pharmaceuticals in the past and they've appealed, has there been a mix of outcomes? Well, appeals are very common. I mean, I I have a rule of thumb that if you have a 100% case, you have an 80% chance of winning. Uh, just because, you know, the lawyers kind of get things so confused that mistakes are made. And so the converse of that is if you have really have a 0% case, you have a 20% chance of winning. And when there's enough money involved, then investing in lawyers to pursue an appeal, even if you don't have much of a case, is seen as a good investment. And, you know, the U.S. is a very, uh, considered a very litigious or, you know, uh, society. There are lots of lawsuits. Uh, I think, you know, it's not at all uncommon for decisions to get reversed on appeal, but because, you know, there are all these decisions that the judge has made. And if you can, you know, get the appeals court to say, well, this one, you know, this one was a mistake and that had a uh, material effect on the, or, you know, that really affected the outcome then they're going to reverse it. Thank you, Jim. And when might we know more about the outcome of this appeal? Well, I would, you know, talk about a year. I mean, I did an appeal in the Seventh Circuit a few years ago, and they issued a decision in, I think, four or five months, and that's pretty fast. So um, sometimes it can be years. Uh, It's usually not less than six months, but we're not even really at the appeal stage yet. The judge has to decide this motion for a new trial first. There's always a chance that GSK and you know Wendy Dolan will settle this case. Um, I think that's somewhat unlikely because, or more than a little unlikely, because I think Wendy's doing it really for the principal. Um, and then GSK presumably doesn't like this precedent that they can be sued for generic drugs. So that's a situation that is, you know, tends to lead to appeals, or in other words, not settling it. But it, it's always a possibility that they'll settle it. Well, I'm sure that Wendy Dolan was cautioned to expect this by her legal team, but it's a lot for her to go through again after the trial, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And it's a, a long ways from over. And there's no doubt in my mind that her lawyers uh, told her that this was uh, going to happen. So, you know, she's really committed to trying to get this out. I mean, from her perspective, in terms of a possible settlement, you know, she's really, I think, achieved a lot of, if not all of what she want, wanted, which was, A, to expose the fraudulent nature of GSK's represent, you know, what they said about what the studies, you know, the safety of Paxil or Paroxetine and, you know, how it causes people even older than 24 to commit suicide. So she's really achieved that. 
and there's this unanimous jury verdict that that's what they decided, and that's just very unlikely to be changed. So then she's got a lot of risk on appeal. So it, it might make sense for her to her to settle. Um, I mean, if she if she doesn't win on appeal, then there's not an appellate decision that says that you can you know someone can sue the the man you know the inventor of the drug for or the original manufacturer for a generic drug so it's just a trial court decision and that doesn't really apply to anyone else necessarily it's not quote the law of the land until an uh, appeals court rules on it so she doesn't have that yet but you know there's probably some considerable risk on appeal to her so um there there's some good reasons for her to settle but i don't know about gsk the damage has kind of been done for gsk hasn't it because the news outlets have already reported that the jury unanimously found gsk guilty of withholding information and irrespective of what happens with an appeal those headlines remain don't they right and the truth of yeah the truth of that is really not going to change it so then when you look at the appeal, I mean, really, what does, even if GSK won, it's not really clear what they would win. And I would suggest, and I suggested it in my article, that, you know, it actually could be seen as a benefit to GSK uh, when drugs come on patent, then they can come out with all these negative things that they haven't disclosed before, and that would cut off the uh, generic lawsuits. On the other hand, they would still have exposure for the time during which, you know, it was under patent and they sold the drug. But the statute of limitations on that is, it varies from state to state, but figure two years normally. So say it goes off patent and they wait two years and they come out with all this negative information on the generic drug and that would cut off their liability. And that's one a- aspect of it. But the other thing is it would suppress the sales of the generic drug, which is what they'd want, and then they might have a new drug that's still on patent uh, that they could continue to lie about and get doctors to prescribe. And Jim, you also mentioned the clinical trials of Paxil conducted by GSK. It appears that the number of suicides during these trials was misrepresented to the US Food and Drug Administration. I just wondered about your reflections on that. Can we really trust what pharmaceutical manufacturers tell us about psychiatric drugs? Oh, absolutely not. It's outrageous. I mean, I personally take the position that I don't want to take any drug that's still on patent because you don't really know what's what the truth about them until they come off of patent. And, and then the drug companies tend to let out the negative information and, and there's been some experience. But basically, you know, the uh, medical journals are all compromised. The, the papers are often ghostwritten by the uh, drug companies and they go and search for people to put their names on them. They, you know, they cook the research. Dr. Peter Gertje from um, Denmark, uh, who was one of the founders of the Cochrane Collaboration, which is this independent group of researchers that really digs into the research and issues reports on what the research really says. He wrote a, he, he wrote a book uh, called Deadly Medicines and Organized Crime, where he goes into how so much of medicine is just basically fraudulent and very harmful. So, yeah, and then Dr. David Healy wrote this book called Pharmageddon, he, it, it also really goes into uh, how much harm is being done by um, general medicine, not just uh, psychiatric uh, medicines. I might say one, just like one of the concepts is that, you know, everybody goes in every year to get all these tests done, blood work, et cetera, to, you know, hit you know, targets like cholesterol targets. And, you know, there's correlation between lower cholesterol or at least the bad cholesterol and lower, you know, heart disease and heart attacks. And so there's this assumption, well, if you lower cholesterol, you're going to lower, you know, the risk of heart attacks. And so then the target becomes lowering, the number is lowering cholesterol. But when you actually look at the results, you find that more people die 
for, you know, that are taking these drugs to lower cholesterol than if they don't. And so uh, I, uh, you can call it a proxy or a surrogate target. And that's what so much of medicine is. And, and of course, the business model is not to cure anything, but to treat something uh, continuously so you keep getting uh, recurring revenue from people buying these pills all the time. It's deeply worrying, isn't it? Because there's such a lack of informed consent. In my own case, it took me several years of reading papers and searching online and hearing others' experiences before I felt that I had a good understanding of all the pros and cons of my psychiatric drug. All we really want from this is for our doctors to be honest with us so we can make an informed choice about drug treatment. Right, and I think with the internet uh, and all the information, of course, you have to be careful about trying to figure out what's true and what's not, is I think there's a pretty good argument that you should get rid of prescribing privileges or restrictions on drugs altogether, and that would go a long way towards uh, actually providing more information. Thank you. That would go a long way towards where we need to be. And Jim, again in the Dolan trial, I believe that Stuart Dolan's doctor testified that had he known the correct outcomes of the clinical trials, he wouldn't have prescribed Paxil to anyone. Yeah, I guess I would wonder about that, but it's certainly what he testified to. Hmm. Uh, And that was uh, critical for the causation because uh, one of the legal rules is, but for the lack of information, the the drug wouldn't have been prescribed. So that was a pretty key legal element of Wendy's case was that he wouldn't have been given the drug if his doctor had known about it. I mean, I don't know about you, but, you know, my experience is doctors, you know, tend to minimize all these side effects and they don't really even believe that, or I would call them negative effects, I guess, rather than side effects. And they tend not to even believe when you have them that they're, they're being caused by the drug. I agree. Doctors can play down some potentially life-changing or life-limiting adverse effects. So you can't make that calculation of the potential benefit of being on the drug long term compared to the risks that you need to worry about. Right. And they they basically don't give you information on both of those. And I think um, these antidepressants are really maybe even the most dramatic example of that. I mean, basically, the research shows that Except for really severely depressed people, they don't really help, and they have a lot of negative effects. And maybe even 50% of people take, taking them, it causes sexual dysfunction. And so, you know, where's the, you know, the cost-benefit analysis, the risk-benefit analysis that supports prescribing them? It's just not there. And, and one of the things is that depression, for most people, will you know, remit or get better in, you know, six weeks or so anyway. And so the benefits that that one gets, you know, or that one thinks they see when they take the drug is probably really just a natural recovery from being depressed. It does feel like we're prescribing long-term medication for short-term problems, doesn't it? Right. And then you get um, hooked on it. And so it can be very difficult to get off these drugs, as, <laughs> as you know. And it's, it's, you know, really, I think, you know, a very widespread problem. Jim, thank you. I just wondered if there was anything else that you'd like to share with the listeners. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I, um, you know, I financially, I'm unable to continue, but I do have this uh, funding proposal out there uh, for $5 million, <laughs> which I don't really, you know, have any great expectation of getting funded. Uh, but I'm 64 now, and I feel like I really need to get some other lawyers involved to take a, a serious shot at, you know, having an effect. Now, I've won five Alaska Supreme Court cases, uh, most of them on constitutional grounds, and I've got one up there right now. Um, so I feel like I've taken it about as far as I can just by myself. And so that's uh, one thing. And then the other is really the importance of public education. And so I think it's important for everybody, uh, every opportunity to really try and get the truth out there. And I have a policy of accepting, you know, every speaking invitation that I possibly can. 
of this being an example of that. And I think that's that would be good for everybody to have to really get out there and try and educate the public because it, I don't think that we're really going to see a change uh, until the public comes to understand what's really happening. Well, Jim, thank you so much for being willing to stand up for the rights of others and to put yourself in the firing line. That can't be an easy space to operate in. Well, you know, the kind of the most uncomfortable part was when I subpoenaed and then released what I call the Zyprexa papers, which was Eli Lilly uh, having suppressed information about uh, Zyprexa a uh, lanzapine, I don't know if it's called Zyprexa in the UK, causing diabetes and other uh, metabolic problems, uh, also their illegal uh, promotion of prescribing it to children. So that resulted in a series of front page uh, New York Times articles, and Eli Lilly really came after me. And so that was really the only time that uh, my work has been uh, that uncomfortable. Well, Jim, I salute you for being such a social conscience on this. Oh, yeah, you bet. Well, it was scary. And, you know, I knew it was um, pretty likely at the time. Uh, they threatened my law license. They threatened me with contempt of court and uh, all those kind of things. And um, it was a huge uh, legal bill that I ended up with, not all of which I... Uh, have been able to pay. And Jim, I just wondered, if you look at the way that law is practiced around mental health, if you could change one thing that would make the biggest difference to patient rights, what change would you make? Well, I think the lawyers have to be allowed or required to provide um, serious defenses, because that would then get this information out uh, to the judges. And it would just, like I said, only... I don't think more than 10% of the people who get locked up meet actually meet the commitment criteria, and nobody could really be constitutionally drugged against their will. And I, I lay that really, I mean, you could say on the lawyers. So if the lawyers were doing their job, that wouldn't be happening. And the, the lawyers really aren't allowed to mount vigorous defenses. I mean, basically... Uh, at least with respect to being locked up, people have the right to a lawyer. And so the role of the lawyer in reality is to check the box off that they have a lawyer rather than actually provide serious legal defense. So I think that's really where the legal system is broken. Jim, thank you so much. Hearing you will help people understand some of the wider issues around why treatment for mental health is not always as helpful as people believe it is or as it should be. Oh, you know what? That really brings uh, me to something else, too, that maybe I should mention, which is, you know, the open dialogue approach and really Soteria, the Soteria House experiment in the or study in the 1970s really showed that if that for neuroleptically naive people, in other words, people that haven't been put on the neuroleptics, before that, about 80% can recover if they're not put on the neuroleptics. So then there was this other study by uh, Harrow and Job that followed people that had been put on the drugs and some of whom tried to get, you know, got off. And they found that the people who got, got off, 40% recovered. But people who stayed on them, only 5% recovered. And so I think that demonstrates a couple of things. One is how important it is to really have a selective use of the neuroleptics. And I use the term neuroleptic instead of antipsychotic because they don't really have an antipsychotic property for most people. But that if, that if you find the people who can get through it without the neuroleptics, you know, eight out of 10 are going to get better and get through it. But once they get put on it for any, you know, uh, very long, then then only 40% can get better even by getting off. And if you stay on them, only 5% get better. And so really, I think there's a pretty good argument to be made that the neuroleptics decrease the recovery rate from 80% to 5%. And this is really... Um, I think something that 
people don't understand and why it's so important that we have these other approaches that people go to, like open dialogue or soteria type programs, uh, how important the hearing voices network approaches and and uh, peer you know peer run programs where people who've been through it can uh, help other people get through it thank you that's crucial to understand that these drugs are often sold to us as a solution for a problem but we're not told about the alternatives and the different approaches because it doesn't generate revenue well not for the drug companies yeah and it really not really for psychiatry either i mean that's i think when you look back historically, and it's something else that Robert Whitaker has documented so well, is that in the 70s, there got to be all kinds of non-physicians who were doing mental health therapy. But the thing that the psychiatrists had was the right to prescribe that other people didn't. And so th- then they really made this unholy alliance with the, psych- the pharmaceutical industry to really promote the drugs uh, and retain their position as the people who are in charge of mental health treatment. So, you know, you don't really have to be a doctor to, to uh, run these other types of programs. And in fact, um, in Soteria, they, you know, they really minimized uh, psychiatric uh, involvement. I'm really glad that these approaches are getting more recognition and attention, but we need more, don't we? Right, and it, it really needs to be supported, you know, with the funding. And um, I don't know, some, uh, you know, in some ways it's encouraging, in other ways it's pretty hard to see any real fundamental change. Um, and in the U.S., you know, with all of these um, mass shootings that's been going on by people that have been in the mental health system, there's this real witch hunt against uh, people diagnosed with mental illness and a real big push for even more forced drugging, even though it's demonstrable that all of these people were really failures of the mental health system. So the mental health system didn't work. So what what is the solution is to have you know more mental health treatment um, and this more standard mental health treatment, um, which is really kind of the whole way the system works is you know if the drug isn't working uh, add to it either more you know more of that drug or another drug rather than you know look at well gee is this really the way to go jim i can't thank you enough for taking the time to chat with me for the podcast you bet it's been a pleasure well i'm sure you'll agree it was fascinating hearing jim and i really do want to thank him for taking time out to talk about his valuable work madden america news and updates On MaddenAmerica.com this week, Bernalyn Ruiz writes about a large observational study published in CNS Drugs which sheds light on the serious adverse effects of the gold standard antipsychotic clozapine. Researchers reviewed reports submitted over a 22-year span of 43,132 patients on clozapine, reporting that 160 developed serious gastrointestinal hypomotility. The prevalence of serious clozapine-induced hypermotility was found to be 37 per 10,000, and the report's authors call for regulators and manufacturers to update their guidance to reflect current knowledge and risk. Also, Shannon Peters tells us about a new study published in Pediatrics which examines the racial and ethnic differences in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder medication continuation and provider follow-up for children enrolled in Medicaid. The results of the large-scale study, funded by the National Institutes of Health, indicate that African-American youth receive less follow-up care from providers, and both African-American and Hispanic children discontinue medication at higher rates than their white peers. The authors, led by Janet Cummings, an associate professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at Emory University, writes... This study provides the most comprehensive examination of racial and ethnic differences in ADHD treatment continuity and care quality to date among Medicaid-enrolled youth. Overall, our findings indicate that the quality of care among youth initiating ADHD medication is poor. Moreover, the most concerning racial and ethnic disparities in care occur in the rate of treatment disengagement. There have been many critiques of the increased use of psychiatric medication to treat children and concerns about the overdiagnosis of ADHD. However, evidence that racial minorities, especially African-American children, are not receiving the same standard of care as their white peers is a critical issue. 
For more news and updates, you can visit maddenamerica.com and sign up for the free weekly newsletter. I hope you enjoyed listening to this inaugural episode of the Madden America podcast, and please come back each week for a new episode. If you like the podcast and listen in iTunes, please consider leaving a review. Reviews really help to increase listener numbers and to raise awareness of the many issues that we will be discussing over the coming weeks. Thank you so much for listening today, and until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates. 